we heard that more productive, sustainable, and environmentally uh, resilient crops are possible, and you can have your cake and eat it, which is really good news. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to see how genome editing applications um, will change through adaptation of the CRISPR technology in, in sectors. Um, from Professor Aitken, we heard about the role of forests in carbon sequestration, and we heard about the necessity to adapt seed zones to future climates and plant the right trees in the ground, and that time is in a sense right now. And from, from Professor Foster, we heard that bee losses are due to globalization, pests and pathogens, but it has something to do with climate change <coughs> enabling the invasive species to prep, spread. And that bees adapt to local climate, but the adaptation varies depending on the source of the, where the bees come from. So it doesn't look like New Zealand is a new source for bee colony in Canada. And that marker assisted breeding can mitigate borrow infestation. So, uh, there's a lot of thought-provoking ideas and concepts there, and I'd like to open the floor to the audience for questions. Please state your name and your affiliation, and who would you like the question to be answered? Um, any questions? Please. So, um, Leonard touched on this, uh, but Sally, during your presentation, I was wondering, um, the role of epigenetics may be very important, especially in the evolution of trees, because it allows a shorter term reaction to the changing environment. So are you looking at that at all in your seeds? So uh, we're not looking at that. There has been work done um, in conifers, and there, there are effects of the parent environment during uh, embryo maturation that have been shown. Um, they're generally quite a bit smaller than the genetic component, but they do substantially uh, influence climate-related traits. That work was done in Norway spruce. A similar experiment was done in British Columbia that was quite comprehensive, um, where they actually put a field test out, that they put several field tests out involving material that had been produced, the same parents, crossed in warm environments, cold environments, warm environments, <coughs> cold parents, and they found no effects. Um, so it's something that I, I feel like somebody should take on uh, investigating more thoroughly, um, but I would also say that the evidence that we have to date uh, suggests that the majority of the variation in adaptive traits that we're seeing is genetically based. Uh, just to add to that, we do find Lines. When we when we identify um, genes through uh, association mapping, for example, and then and then project those back onto the landscape, we find clines in those in those allele frequencies um, in different materials, and so those relationships would be weaker if if epigenetics was playing a big role in in those cases. So. We've got a variety of pieces of evidence. The, the last thing I'll, I'll mention is that we have compared material from the breeding programs uh, to natural populations, and the breeding programs produce result that produce trees that then go into seed orchards that produce seed, and most of that seed is produced in the Okanagan Valley in BC, and we don't see differences. Um, in adaptive traits between those materials in the breeding program produced in the Okanagan Valley, where it's very warm, and the natural populations those, those trees came from, seed collected in the natural populations. So we don't see any evidence in that work that suggests that there's a, much of an epigenetic component. It, it's one of those things we have to still keep, be aware of and, and keep looking at, but in our own materials we haven't we haven't seen sort of uh, a variance that could be unex that could be unexplained variance that we could explain through through that. Thank you. Any more questions for the panel? Yes. Uh, Richard Hamlin at UBC. Uh, question for Lauren. Right. So uh, you you kind of make a great case of showing the, the natural variability and adaptation in, in, in sunflower. Uh, so then, and, and also of crosses, uh, you know, yielding drug resistance. 
and the sunflowers. So, so there must be those naysayers saying, well, what do you need genomics for? So what's, what's, the, what's the argument uh, uh, to, to, to use genomics you know, to, to further the, the weeding? So the, the main argument, well, there are a couple arguments for genomics. One is, is that if you actually know the gene and mutation, Knowing the gene involved, it can be very difficult to move these traits into the genetic background without bringing along a lot of crap that the breeders don't want. And by crap, I mean things like sterility, branching, um, uh, a, a growth form that they don't like, a change of flowering time, um, a, 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 a reduction in seed size, and so forth. So all sorts of things can come along. And so what genomics can do is it can really allow you to determine the recombinant that is the very smallest, and just move the very smallest possible fragment into your um, cultivated line. It also allows you to do it into many different locally adapted cultivars simultaneously, rather than just uh, a conventional breeding program. You have to keep your effective population sizes very high in order to do, to do it effectively. Um, on a broader scale, the real key is, is what you really want to find is actually the causative mutation, so you can use CRISPR or other genome editing method so you can take something from sunflower or wild sunflower and put it into uh, wheat or corn or soybean. So that's the long, the longer haul is that we can hopefully take that information and it's very much going to be a, a, a global effort where information from um, all of the crops in Arabidopsis can be used to, to basically predict which mutations are not only going to have the, the largest effects, desirable effects, but which ones are least likely to have the negative trade-offs. And so I sort of see this as being a global effort that's a big data effort as much as it is a, a, an experimental effort. Of course, you knew all that. It was a weird question. <laughs> Thank you. Another question? Yes. CRISPR or gene editing could have any potential application. 
And I will be also interested in learning, uh, maybe from Lauren and from all the panel, if you see that um, there will be any regulatory barriers to the use and implementation of uh, gene editing technologies that could help us advance into understanding, adapting, and acting on climate change. Sure, I'll go first. Um, so, people, the, the first demonstration of CRISPR in bees has, has uh, been done, um, so it's possible. Uh, the main limitation for real applied use is that we, we really don't understand a lot of the molecular mechanisms, so there's a lot of basic research that has to happen before you could go and guess what uh, gene to try and edit. Um, but of course, I think there's a there's obviously a huge potential there uh, in bees as well. Uh, the regulatory issues, um, I haven't followed it that closely because I think it's going to come up in plants before it's going to come up in, in bees. But if uh, if CRISPR modified genomes get classified as GMOs, then then we might as well forget it because it's not going anywhere. Um, uh, but the potential is just so enormous that uh, I really hope that we find a better way to deal with the regulatory issues. But uh, I may be um, uninformed as to how far the regulatory uh, process has gone with CRISPR as well. So I can speak a little bit to trees uh, on this. So I think that there's uh, <coughs> CRISPR is a remarkable technology. Uh, I think the first uh, demonstration of its use in trees was with poplar, some work that Dr. C.K. Sai did at the uh, University of Georgia. And she showed that, I mean, the results are just so consistent compared with, uh, with transgenic uh, techniques. Um, so I think there are, I think there's a lot of potential in a couple of areas. One is short rotation fiber crops on, on private lands. So uh, poplar, eucalyptus uh, predominantly, where you've got rotation lengths of six, seven, uh, eight years, um, and you're really growing a fiber crop. Um, and they grow clonal blocks already, so they'll put a single clone over a, a large area. Um, another is the case with uh, with um, threatened species. So, for example, American chestnut has, has using transgenic techniques, uh, American um, chestnut blight resistant American chestnut has been generated, and um, there is no natural resistance within that species whatsoever. So, that has the potential to prevent species extinction. Um, the BC situation is a little different. We have very long rotation links, um, we have many species that are being managed um, on over 95% of public lands. And there's a big emphasis on maintaining diversity. Um, and so more, so there may be very specific applications that have opportunities, um, but the conventional breeding has somewhat higher acceptance you know, among the public and among foresters and, and other stakeholders. And um, whether, I think whether CRISPR will play a role, and also the, the most of the traits that are important for climate change involve many, many genes. So that, again, they're, they're challenging. So I think that's, that's farther off. There may be very specific um, disease or insect resistant situations where, where um, it has potential. I have a question to the audience. How many people in the audience are involved in climate change research? I think similar to that. You know, if you would, and how many of those are using genomics as a tool? Okay, uh, would any of you or the panel speak to how could we encourage application of these tools into um, adaptation of climate change? Anybody willing to speak from the audience? Maybe you can uh, ask the panel first then. I thought maybe, let's see, okay, it's pretty easy, no, um, I thought maybe I would first sort of answer, address the regulatory issue question that Catalina um, um, put forward since, and then I'll, I'll address the, the question about how to use it. So, 
I think the, the regulatory situation is the big unknown. It's interesting that the USDA in the first um, CRISPR-related release chose not to regulate it at all um, because they didn't see that um, it's not you know GM. It's just a, a um, and so I think it was with a mushroom um, uh, kept the mushroom from growing brown or something. So useful trait. Um, so I imagine it's going to be that the U.S. will not regulate. I think Canada will because it's a novel product. And I think Europe is probably the big question as to exactly what they do. I, I, I can't really predict at this point what they will do. Um, so I think it's not going to be a uniform response and I think it is going to be the single biggest kernel to, to, for CRISPR sort of flowering in agriculture. Um, technology is going to be an issue as well. Now, um, plants are not quite as easy as animals. Um, it turns out that people have been very successful mainly at using CRISPR for knockouts in, in plants, but not for a sort of um, allele replacement. So I would be cautionary as to how, but DuPont and Dow and so forth are, are putting huge amounts into it, and, and certainly we'll see uh, drought tolerant cultivars of, of, of corn based on CRISPR coming out in five years. I've actually seen that predicted. Um, so that gives you some, some idea of the regulatory climate. Um, I should also point out that the companies love it because it provides IP. Mm -hmm. um, so um, they're investing enormous amounts into CRISPR-Cas9 um, with the idea because they can then protect their traits, which you can't do with, little, with, with natural little variants. They don't like the approach I'm taking very much because they can't protect those alleles intellectually. So it's um, they're interested in it, but they, they worry they would rather combine a natural variant with a CRISPR-related change so that they get the IP plus the good wheels. So it's kind of a, a, an interesting thing. Um, in terms of how to use CRISPR, I mean, with crops, I think it's for climate change. I mean, I think the, the key thing is, is we know from Arabidopsis, from maize, about particular mutations that um, uh, that provide drug tolerance. Drug tolerance is the world's most important trait right now. Um, that is absolutely the biggest single application will be to put some of those mutations in a lot of our different crops. Um, and that, that will happen, I think, quickly, and I think within five years we'll see quite a number of CRISPR-enabled drug tolerant crops being grown worldwide. Okay, so I guess um, we can stop here. You're on the uh US-based climate change genomics um, organization. So that's where I was thinking of, of what can Canada do, what can we do, how can we get more involved in, in uh, things like this, and what can we share with the audience so that we inspire some people. Huh. Well, I mean, we, uh, um, you know, Canada, there are certain crops that Canada plays a huge role in. Um, um, canola is the obvious one where and, and canola is, is quite, quite tractable in, in terms of biotechnology. We absolutely should see um, um, gene engineering um, um, going on with canola, and I'm sure it already is. Uh, interesting thing about canola, um, so certain crops are primarily private sector, and certain ones are primarily public sector. Um, wheat is still mainly a, a public sector beauty crop, and so I would see wheat as something that the Canadian um, um, academic sector could play a large role in. In fact, they're really important wheat and lentil breeding programs in Saskatoon. So certainly um, beans are another one. Um, so there are certain crops where Canada should lead because of the, the wheat and breeding programs are in Canada. But I think also we should be looking at, <coughs> um, at developing country crops as well, where we can play a large role in terms of providing Canadian expertise um, uh, um, um, everything from millet to cassava to uh, um, um, rice and so forth. So it doesn't have to be just a purely Canadian um, um, crop, a purely Canadian effort. But from a crop perspective, I mean, we should um, um, be supporting the mid circuit, supporting, um, and so as you know, Canada supporting these these biotechnology projects. Senator, you have a comment? So I think that in terms of, of the genomics, rather than CRISPR, I think that uh, we're seeing a uh, we're seeing more and more partnerships between the traditional breeding organizations and the people with the expertise on the genomic end of things, who are usually universities. 
Um, and uh, I know uh, with our work, there's a new uh, EU project that's about an 8 million euro project that's uh, just started up called uh, Gentry, and they're looking at 12 species in Europe. And we have, uh, and so this ability to do comparative work and transfer information um, across related species, I think, will really um, benefit from open sharing of, of that information uh, and uh, between groups working on related species. And generally, it's uh, there's not a lot of IP in the conifer realm, uh, so it and, and the community is very open to sharing. So that really speeds things up, even though the trees take forever to grow. <laughs> is that it? Um, let's see. So uh, I think Canada can play quite a big role in food uh, freedom, uh, and the main reason is that we're one of the, or probably the biggest customer of uh, New Zealand beekeepers, and uh, we represent about thirty or forty percent of the market for the uh, Hawaiian and California uh, beekeepers as well. Uh, so we bat about well above our, our weight class there. Um, for uh, in terms of the, the US overall US economy. Uh, and the, the same issues that we're facing uh, are also present, or are also going to be big challenges in Europe, which is the other big uh, beekeeping area. And uh, there are a lot of uh, inter or inter uh, international barriers to moving bees, so there's something to be overcome there. But uh, like Sally said, with forestry, the, the beekeeping uh, there's very little IP, essentially no IP in the in the bee uh, biotechnology world, um, and that community is also very open. So I think um, with Canada as our, our economy um, playing a pretty big role in the international bee scene, uh, and the the um, what we have developed here already in terms of uh, bee breeding programs, we we, we can play quite a big role. Uh, and even though we might not be able to move bees, we can move the knowledge and use that, those selection approaches uh, in other areas. I should also add that um, if, if Lauren solves the drug crawl tolerance issues, then he also solves a lot of bee issues uh, in terms of climate change. If there's flowers, bees are going to uh, be with us, I think, um, in terms of uh, what our climate might look like in a few years. I think we should keep in mind that uh, Bees came out of Africa, so they're used to uh, climate, or they're, they're they developed in climates that are, are uh, much different than ours now. So as long as there's food and water, uh, bees will, I think, adapt quite well. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience or comments? Yes, please. Sorry about seeing corn seed. I'm sitting from UBC. Um, I just have a question, which isn't so genetics related, but I'm just burningly curious about what kind of Proteins are associated with social hygiene. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I didn't get into that, obviously. Uh, there are several, the, the proteins that we're most closely linked are related to odor and perception. Uh, so our hypothesis is that uh, the bees, those hygienic bees are, are more able to, to smell, basically, that there's a dead or dying larva there, and that's triggering some some reaction in their brain uh, that causes them to clean those up. That's a hypothesis. We're testing that. Mm -hmm. We still have time for some questions. Yes, please. Hi, yeah, I'm Scott Trevor Bruce and joined UBC. Uh, another question for Lena, kind of a follow up. So I wonder, you're using that state to measure your proteins, right? Yeah. What else would you use? Yeah, <laughs> naturally. So, You've been looking at the relative abundance of these proteins in these different sort of subtypes of feeds. I wonder, are you also looking at amino acid polymorphic variants within those proteins? So we uh, we have not done that yet. We're uh, currently the project we just started. We're collecting both genomic and proteomic sequences on the colony or proteomic profiles on the colony. So we will be able to to look for um, polymorphisms in the uh, amino acid sequences. Um, 
it's up until just recently, obviously, it hasn't been very feasible to um, sequence at the scale you need to be able to do that, but we're going to do that in this coming project. Any more questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think, oh, did I miss? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, hi, I'm Andy here from Simon Fraser University. I just want to ask kind of a naive question, uh, given what's happening in Fort McMurray. There have been these uh, discussions about the possibility of moving species northward. And I wonder, given what you also said about the fact that trees have adapted to their local environments over thousands of years, there must be many other variables besides temperature involved. Is it really realistic to think we can just move species northward and is there any jurisdiction that actually has proactive policies to do so? Uh, so I'll answer that first, a brief comment about the Fort McMurray situation, and then, uh, and then the, the issue of, of moving species ranges. Um, so with the, you know, the Fort McMurray fire is in the boreal forest, and the boreal forest is a fire uh, disturbance ecosystem. So um, the fires are, they're earlier, they're bigger, um, there's more fuel because of fire suppression. Uh, so that all came together and climate change certainly playing a role there. But there's other factors. One of the things about, about forests that I think is an interesting one, uh, and I just saw a paper on this, is that so the broadleaf species are more fire resistant. They're less likely to propagate a large crown fire, so fire moving through the tops of the trees. And one of the interesting things to me is that these communities maybe ought to be putting swaths of um, swaths of uh, poplars, trembling aspen, for example, around them, um, potentially for a bit of a fire break from the kind of coniferous forest. Um, that's an aside, but that's not moving species because that species is already there, and it will come back actually after the fire, come back quite vigorously. Um, but in terms of moving species. It, most of our work is involved in moving genotypes, not moving species. Um, there is one example of a species that is approved for movement outside its natural range, and that's western larch. But it's only being, it's being moved, you can move it several hundred kilometers. So within an area that it would have, dis it would have dispersed to, you know, over the next couple of centuries kind of thing. Um, not, long, not really long distance movements. In terms of other environmental factors, of course climate is very complex. Climate is not one thing, it's many, many things. It's temperature and precipitation and their combinations in different seasons. Uh, so many, many effects to, to climate. And we've been able, the genomic data has helped us really decompose which of those is important and which ones the trees don't seem to have been adapted to. Um, our soils are very new. The glaciers were here 15,000 years ago. They scraped everything off. Our soils are young and they're relatively homogeneous. We don't see local adaptation to soil. Photo period is a big one, and that was a question I had for Leonard. As you change latitude, you change climate, but you also change day length, night length, and I wondered whether bees are, are sensitive to that. Um, so we have to be careful about photo period. Um, there also may be aspects of the biotic environment that they're adapted to whether it's pests and pathogens or soil microbes, mycorrhizal fungi, all those things. Um, with the conifers, um, we don't have strong evidence of those things yet. I think if you went into tropical, subtropical situations where the soils are much older, the ecosystems have been there a lot longer, you might find a lot more of that local adaptation of other factors. What about photoperiod of bees, Leonard? Um, so I don't know that anybody has looked at that, but one little anecdote that uh, I would add uh, that related, I guess, also to Fort McMurray is that the area just um, just west of Fort McMurray is actually one of the best honey-producing regions of the world because the days are so uh, long in the middle of the summer. Um, and uh, so bees, one thing that is certainly related to Fort McMurray is the length of uh, the, the lifespan of an individual bee, like a, an insect, rather than the superorganism, which is the colony. Uh, as you get to longer days, the bees live less time. So the average length of 
length of uh, lifespan of an adult bee is about three weeks, maybe just over that. Um, in the peace region, they can live as short as uh, 10 days uh, because they're working so hard. Um, so there probably is some effect uh, of photo period too. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for the great questions and please uh, join me in thanking the panel for the great discussion.